matter who you are, where you are, what your choices have been, and what karmic timelines and contracts you have journeyed, the light is calling for the reunification of all aspects of life in this realm now. It is calling for the cleansing of all polarities. It is calling for the rising of all sacred heart centers now. All are being summoned home to the greater light now. Hi, and welcome everyone to Whole Soul Mastery's Live Well, Live Whole podcast series. I'm Marie Moeller. I'm an author, intuitive, and the host of these podcasts. And I'm here with Dr. Paul Panzica. We're back again in July 2021. I'm so grateful that you're joining me again today because we always have adventures together. And I have a feeling today we're going to go on another big adventure. And you know, we are these brave epic heroes. We are these mythological characters. We are these archetypal characters. And we came for these times and we came to explore in these times and we came to be conduits in these times. And I think today you and me, Paul, and I I'm grateful for our listeners tuning in as well. We're going to be conduits and explorers in this great adventure in this podcast today. So Thank you for joining me. And I want to turn it over to you to just lead us because I know there's some things in your heart you want to say. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. And so, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things going on uh, in the world and in the vapors and in the universe. And, and we have a, we are, not only do we have a front row seat, but we're the players in all of this, you know, we are, we are at ground zero. So we, we are, we are getting, we, and, and that's, that's something that's interesting is that um, we can, we can be coached and we can get advice and we can have information channeled to us through our, our ascended masters and teachers, but um, they still can't really see the big picture unless they're standing on the planet and so they're at ground zero and experiencing this one of the things that was conveyed by the great teacher rudolf steiner was that um the world was so fouled up by that process and we looked at like maybe ten thousand years of a, of a of a time period where um the, the, the mentors and our spiritual guides physically left us. Mm -hmm. And so that was after the fall of Atlantis. And so during that time, and they, they may have been around, but the, 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 the point was is they withdrew their consciousness further and further and further away from us, or our consciousness withdrew further and further and further away from them. So that what used to work in the past and everything is based upon ages, we just entered into a new age, um, which lasts about 2,160 plus years, is that those methods, those methods only work for a certain period of time and then their energies dissipate and then something new has to, has to come along for us to connect again. But, um, <clears throat> but things got so fouled up from this process that uh, approximately 2,000 plus 2,000 years ago, um, uh, let's say the, uh, the God had to manifest himself onto the planet to actually see how screwed up things were. And um, so there was an avatar who incarnated into this world. We all know his name. And, and this avatar um, became the vessel for the incarnation of what people after him, the masters who came after him or who lived during his time came to recognize as the Logos. And so the Logos actually was here upon this plane of, 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 of consciousness upon this world. And, 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 and the Logos had this experience 
and was able to see through the energies of this great magnanimous soul. And some people actually say there were two souls, not one soul involved in all of this, which is in itself a great mystery. And I don't want to get bogged down in the details of that. But that, that this person who, whose ministry lasted for three years was able to give us a roadmap out of this chaos. And, 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 and quite frankly, um, he only was initiated. The process was only initiated at that point, which was 2000 plus years ago. Um, and it's now coming to fruition today. And so today we are now, we had mentioned this before, um, at the beginning of a new age. This is the age of, of, of the water bearer, the age of Aquarius. And, and, and I've got written extensively about this and we've had discussions about why it is the new age, but it is. We are seeing through the astrology of, of everything that's happening that we are now moving into a new age where time is changing its character, right? And so things that we were working on for the last 2000 years is finally coming to fruition. And so, and so, so the, the bottom line uh, in regarding this <clears throat> is that there is a path and it's like, it's like we're trying to ascend a mountain. And so let's, we're trying to t climb the tallest mountain in the world, which is not Everest. It's actually Mauna, Mauna, Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's mm -hmm. the tallest mountain in the world. It measured from the base of the mountain to the peak. It's 30,000 feet tall. It's, it's, just a, it's just a fact. So, so whether or whatever mountain you decide that you want to climb, let's say it's Everest or the hardest mountain to ascend in the world, um, <clears throat> you can start climbing the mountain from many different perspectives. But as we start getting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher up the mountain, there's really only maybe one safe passage to the peak. And so there's really towards the end of the journey, one pathway that's viable. And that pathway has already been well articulated by this logos being who saw what was happening. He saw what was happening. <clears throat> and, um, and, and maybe I, want, I might wanna read this passage to you because I was looking at it and I was saying, Boy, this is really this is really important. And so let me just read this passage. <clears throat> and so maybe it sounds familiar to you. Maybe it doesn't. But keep an open mind. And let me just read this. It begins with the Amen. So this is like a prayer. And then it says, the evils hold sway. Witness of egoity freeing itself. Selfhood guilt through others incurred, experienced in the daily bread, wherein the will of the heavens does not rule, because man separated himself from your realm and forgot your names, your fathers in, he in the heavens. So does that sound somewhat familiar? What do you think? I mean, so the, the familiarity of it is that it's, it forms or conforms to a very similar construct, which we call the Lord's Prayer, because we have this concept of daily bread and fathers in heaven. Right. But it's the antithesis of the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's, it's what he saw when he came down here and experienced this, this life. And he saw what happened. And I think you can apply this to what's happening right now today in this realm where he says the evils hold sway. And he says that we are witnessing egoity freeing itself. He saw it then, but it's now, it's now unleashed itself into this, into this, into this, in this incredible chaos that we're now seeing. It's coming to fruition. Selfhood guilt through others incurred. This is when we're not being truthful. This is when we're, when we're being selfish. This is when we're out for ourselves. We are amassing transgressions, karmic transgressions. The world is still like that. 
experienced in our daily bread. So these are the things that we must do in order to survive within the chaotic, chaotic hierarchy that evil has established within this world. Wherein the will of the heavens do not rule. It's the will of the ego that's ruling right now. Because man separated himself from the heavenly realm and forgot, forgot your names, <clears throat> the fathers, our fathers in heaven. And so that's where this comes from. And so the story behind it is extremely detailed and beautiful. And I'm not going to get into the details of that. But we are here now to rectify those, those problems. And again, that path that we were given is at the end is a unification path, which we must walk. And we must understand that those, that, those, that those teachings that were given to us are essential teachings. They're the essential teachings that we must follow. And I don't see us being able to ascend beyond a certain point unless we start coming into awareness of those teachings. And until we start following the path that was outlined for us through the ministry of all of those who were involved in the ascension or the dissension of the logos. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. Now, I'd like to keep going, but I don't know. Do you want to make some comments or do you want to just let me keep going? I don't know. I, I want you to keep going. I just wanted to ask you for people who are hearing about the logos for the first time. Can you just yeah. give us a little context about that? Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's something that we, we have to talk about too. It, it has to do with the polarities of the spirit, the polarities of the spirit. And that's something that I really wanted to talk about. So that was a perfect question to lead us into, which is that um, I don't know if a lot of people realize this. I take a lot of things for granted. Be I don't know, these things came to me so easily, but there was also a lot of uh, diligence and scholarship and all these other things involved. But this is what I was interested in. And I realized many people aren't interested in that. So there, the, when we're looking at esoteric information, when we're looking at higher knowledge, higher wisdom, we have to look at this, this, this one major law that's given to us. And that just simply says, as above, so below, a microcosm relationship within a macrocosm relationship exists. And, and that is really the only rule that we really need to understand. We need to follow that rule. It helps us to understand things so much better. So one of the questions that we can ask is simply, is God a man? Because it, it refers to the fathers in heaven, mm -hmm. right? So I know a lot of people already will be turned off by the fact that this is a very masculine oriented injunction or invocation. Mm -hmm. So let me clear that up right away. God is both. God is, God is all. So we should not get into some ridiculous argument that because this person articulated these things in this way, that this person is actually outmoded or outdated or wrong. This person is not wrong. This person is exceedingly accurate in what this person is stating. The question is, is where does the logos exist in relationship to the feminine principle of God. The Logos is the masculine principle of God. It is a light principle. It is a solar principle. And so we can look at the Logos as the sun, or we can look at the Logos as the son of the sun, or we can look at the Logos as a greater sun than the one that we're familiar with, which is a galactic sun. That is Logos energy. So the Logos is a masculine energy that emanates in the form of light. So that's what the logos is. That's the logos energy. Um, the feminine energy is, is different. The feminine energy is, um, is mother nature. So mother nature is a feminine principle. Now, the people that knew this mystery of the logos, which is really the mystery of the sun, the solar mysteries, the sun mysteries, they call themselves the, the, 
the, the, the sons, because these were mainly men, the, the sons of the widow. Oh, wow. The sons of the widow is what they called themselves. And what does that mean? It means that there was a group of initiates who incarnated themselves into the earth thousands of years ago to act as a masculine principle to ground this logos or to stabilize this logos into the earth. This has a lot to do with what happened in Lemuria and it has a lot to do with what happened in Atlantis and I quite frankly don't want to go into all the details of that. All I can tell you is, is that to this day in these masculine oriented Masonic organizations, mm. they are known to each other as the sons of the widow. Now, Jesus was a son of a widow because his mother died. And, and uh, I'm sorry, his father died. And, 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 and so he was the son of a widow. His father died at a relatively young age from what the scriptures tell us. Another son of the widow was Mani. And I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but there's a passage in the Bible which talks about um, the, um, the, the son of the widow of Nam, Nam, I believe, Nam, the son of the widow of Nam. And, and that is when Jesus resurrects um, a, like a 12 year old boy who is known as the son of the widow of Nam, right? And so according to esoteric scholarship, <clears throat> that boy became what they call the paraclete which was um, Mani, the great um, initiate Mani, who followed in Jesus' footsteps a few hundred years after his life and became um, the, the founder of a, of, a, of a very mystical religion called uh, what we call Manichaeism. Manichaeism. Mm -hmm. but, but Mani was one of these initiates. And so there is this, this, um, this, this esoteric... Um, stream of consciousness that brings in this masculine energy into the plane of the earth. What was the goal? And so I think I've explained this before. The earth was uh, and this lower 3D realm was created in a very unique way in the way that it was godless. And so the, they, they had to create a world where there was an illusion that there was no God principle. Now, the God principle that we're talking about is the masculine God principle, not the feminine God principle. The feminine God principle has always been here. This is the feminine God principle of nature, the divine feminine. It exists within us, within our hearts. It's always been there. And the initiates who came here, they were like, they were like masters of a certain philosophy. And that's funny because that's what the word philosophy means. It means lover of Sophia, lover of the divine feminine. Wow. And so these men were true philosophers and they pledged their life's teaching and their life's energy to the resurrection of the father in this plane of consciousness. And the only way that that could be done as to, is that could be done is through their own initiate is through their own their own um, through their own efforts and the, and and so this had to be done um, as a, as a son of the father because the father was withdrawn within this plane of consciousness the father doesn't exist within this plane of consciousness so again when the when the um, when this, when the, when the, when the philosopher, when the, when the, um, the, um, the what do we say, the, the uh, existentialist says there is no God, right? That's true. There is no God because we've created a construct in the third density mm -hmm. where God was withdrawn, and if you look at the mythologies, God was killed. Osiris was killed, which was the father God. So all God was destroyed. And so, so there was no God. So now we live in a godless society. And what did this happen? This happened around the fall of Atlantis. So maybe 10,000 years ago is when this truly happened. And so we had this to go was purposeful. This was, I just want to, 
understand that. It sounds like that was also purposeful on the Atlanteans' part. Well, the Atlanteans blew themselves to smithereens. They blew themselves up. And if you want to get a good idea of what Atlantis was, I just discovered this song. Donovan sings a song called Atlantis. The, the, folk, the folk musician, the 60s folk musician Donovan wow. um, sings this song. And it's Song of Atlantis. If you want to find out what Atlantis is, just listen to the song. And you have the whole song. The, uh, the whole song lasts about three and a half minutes. But he tells you the story of the beginning of Atlantis. Atlantis fell. Like all things within the cycle of this, of this earthly pattern. I think we're probably we're cycling between third density and fourth density and third density and fourth. Regardless, what happens is, is that um, we have to come to the spiritual realm through different ways. And, and we create systems that work for a while, but then the forces of evil, which is really the egotistical forces, come in and they start perverting things and they destroy. And so they did the same thing in Atlantis that they've done today, which is divide and conquer through mind control, through deception. Um, <clears throat> in fact, read Mein Kampf, and then you'll find out exactly the way that they destroyed Atlantis. Atlantis existed, and it was all based on the law of one, and the law of oneness, and the law of balance, and an understanding of karma. Then Edgar Cayce starts talking about how beings or people or souls from another realm came in to this world, and they started to pervert those, those foundational principles, the laws of balance, the laws of oneness, the laws of karma. The people of Atlantis called themselves the children of the law of one. Well, then there became a new faction, and that new faction would call themselves the sons of Belial. Mm. And Belial was a fallen angel. <clears throat> Belial was darkness. Belial was ego. And so they became the sons of Belial. And as long as they gave homage to Belial, as long as they, as long as they glorified the self through um, a, a religion which was based upon empowering this energy called Belial, then anything was fine. So it was basically it was a very egocentric religion which was created, which, as, as Casey said, it was a religion of self-aggrandizement. Does that sound familiar, right? <laughs> We've been Self living it. Aggrandizement. Now, Rudolf Steiner said, well, the same thing's going to happen. And it's going to come to fruition again right now in the time that we're living. And it's going to create what he called the war of the ego against the ego or the war of the all against all, which is really what we're seeing. Hopefully the fruition or the end of it, mm -hmm. at least within the next few years, perhaps, maybe we have to still go through this. I don't know. But I really haven't really gotten to the core of what I wanted to speak about. And so the, the core of what I wanted to speak about has to do with the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And the only way that we can bring the divine masculine into this realm of consciousness is through our own initiative, our, our, our own uh, you know, initiation and our, own, um, and our own efforts. And that's the only way we can bring it in. And then, so when we ascend our consciousness as, let's say, one of the functions of divine masculine power is to ascend our consciousness and to help to channel that energy into, the, into, the, into this world um, in union with the divine feminine, in cooperation with the divine feminine. It's important to remember that the polarities exist. And it's important to remember that as we ascend, the polarities become stronger. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it will meld and it will create unions, but the polarities will become stronger. They won't become weaker. And that's one of the problems that I'm seeing that's facing us right now is how we, we come to cherish the function of those polarities and not only maintain them, but to enhance them. Because we have to understand what the true purpose of masculine power is and what the true purpose of feminine power is. And we have to work in cooperation and union with each other to help to um, uh, uh, exponentially increase it through working together in cooperation between the sexes. 
So this is really what I wanted to talk about, which was, um, is, is the separation of the sexes. And this is, if this wasn't esoteric enough, it's gonna get a lot more esoteric. Do you wanna take a Let's break? Thank our minute? listeners for hanging. I think this is perfect. I, okay. And I think people are, are, to be honest, the crisis of faith, the crisis of spirituality, the darkness we've been living in, those that can hang in a conversation like this are ready for these next insights that are deep. And, but they're really in the depths of our soul that are flushing to the surface, the things that we know, which is the roadmap up and out of this, this you know, entrapment, this enslavement and all the programming that goes with it. So uh, please keep going. Right, so if you read Blavatsky or if you read Steiner or if you read these great esoteric scholars, they'll talk about human beings living as far back in the, into the Lemurian times and, and even in the early Atlantean times as having completely different bodies. It's hard to accept, I, I, I get it. But keep in mind that everything that we've been talking about is that we're moving into different territories within the galaxy itself and with ambient energies, which may transform or change the nature of the, phys the physical world itself. That's really what the whole transformation and ascension is all about. So there may have been a time where we were living where human beings were less formed. And I, and I, I remember reading this and going, oh, this is just insane. I don't know how the hell this, this okay. can make any sense. But let's just keep this in mind that there was a time when human, human beings were both genders. Yes. And they still are. It's just that they could manifest themselves in both ways freely. And as the esoteric scholars said, their reproduction was something along the lines of self-fructification, which means they did not need any sexual union with another being in order to manifest life. a new being, a new life. Right. So it's called self-fructification. Self-fructification. <clears throat> so this existed. Not only did this exist, we were these newly forming beings that existed, but we were <clears throat> governed or stewarded by <clears throat> higher beings. So as the story goes, there was something that existed, which was akin to a fire cloud. This is how Rudolf Steiner describes it. He says there was a fire cloud, which is interesting because Yahweh means pillar of fire in some, in some instances, or cloud or fire. It's usually presented in the old you know, Hebrew texts as some kind of a fiery cloud or cloud. So we had conscious connections to the higher realms through an interface or a matrix that he described as a fire cloud. This is when we were unipolar or bipolar, let's say, so to speak, mm -hmm. or encompassing the, the, the creator, which, is, which has all these energies within it. Right. All right. So, but then there came a time where um, we started separating from this relationship. We weren't very well individualized. Once we started becoming individualized, and really I think that was the experience that Atlantis was all about, was becoming individuated beings. We started becoming our own self. We started to individuate. We started to form and we started to become more, more solid. And we started to declare polarities within, our, within a gender. What we forgot is that we're still both genders. I have a feminine soul. And Marie, you have a masculine soul. That's just how it is, right? So the outside manifests in one polarity while the inside manifests in another polarity, right? And so that has always existed. And so we started to <clears throat> manifest in a much more individuated way. And at some point it begins to formulate into a reality that we can begin to understand, which is that the fire cloud dissipated. We can't come to the spiritual realm through that 
through, through, through that interface anymore. Um, but you know, if you think about it, the fire cloud is represented by the Star of David, which also represents the Merkaba. Perfect. As above, so below. So you have this pyramidal structure in three dimensional space, you know, pointing downward, and then you have the three dimensional structure in, in the physical space pointing upward, and the interface is the merge of those two things, and you start spinning it around. You got a Merkaba. And so, what was really interesting, and what Steiner had suggested, I mean, all of this when he said, when I read it, well, yeah, that, that makes complete sense, is that there were beings from the higher realms of consciousness that wanted to experience the physical world that we're living on. And this is the way that they did it. They used this interface to experience it through us, through us. And we experience the spiritual realm through that interface through them. So he said that the spiritual realm was working to descend their consciousness into this matrix. And we were worried, we were, we were working on ascending our consciousness into their matrix. So that was the interface. Now, there came a point where it all fell apart. I mean, I don't know how it fell apart. I can speculate on it fell apart, but I don't know how it fell apart. I can tell you what Steiner told us. He said that at some point, consciousness was cleaved. That relationship was, was cleaved. And he said that the spiritual energies were withdrawn into the moon. They were withdrawn into the moon, into the sphere of the moon. Now, that's interesting for many reasons. Now, he said that there was also an interface or slightly elevated beings that were still connecting to us, but they weren't those original beings that were like the Yahweh energies that were higher spiritually evolved. They're withdrawn and they're living with, within the deep recesses of, of the moon sphere. So it's, it's what he said, or in, let's just say in a spiritual sphere that we can't easily get to obtain. But there's lesser beings that are interfacing with us all the time. So it really, what he's just describing is how this these higher realms got um, got let's say um, created. So we went from you know just we, we now created an astral realm, right? Which is kind of where these lower astral beings exist, which are still interfacing with us constantly. Which is where these evil forces, um, more or less, have come in and hijacked everything. And then there's a further ascended group of more spiritual forces that are much harder to access it and to connect to. Mm -hmm. And, 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 the, and the secret was the moon. It was, it was all buried within the, the, this moon, this moon, this, the sphere of the moon. Now, what he said at some point was the moon separated from the earth. Now, I don't know what you know about the moon, but I'm just going to keep going with this. The moon is a, is a, is a freaking mystery. We have no idea where it came from. It is an artificial satellite. It is not natural. And even, you know, um, even, even top uh, uh, astronomers, you know, Carl Sagan said the moon is a, is, is a, is a hollow sphere. It's not part of the creation. Henceforth, it is not a natural sphere. It's, it's hollow. The Apollo astronauts took their what is that? I think it's the, the lunar module or whatever. When they, when, they, when they blasted off from um, the moon to get back into the command module, they took that module, they, they pointed it towards the moon, and they shot it back towards the moon and crashed on the moon. And before they left, they had seismographic instruments to record what would happen when this, when this vehicle crashed into the moon. And it went off like a gong. It started ringing. Like a hollow sphere for about an hour, so that helped to validate that theory. And if you look at hmm. any of the information that's coming from other sources, it says that the moon itself may be made out of uh, titanium alloys. It's you know the crust is about 22 kilometers thick, and it's it's hollowed inside, and it's really kind of like a whatever it is. It's artificial. It's artificial. And so this is where the, the interesting part 
comes into play, which is that that then Steiner talked about this a lot. He said that the moon is the new moon. He would make references to this. Steiner would say that that moon that's orbiting the earth right now is not the original moon. So he was saying that in like 1908, right? In 1920. I mean, how the heck did this guy know this stuff? But he was saying that. So that he said that that, that moon sphere is different than what the original moon was. And we don't know where the original moon is. Is well, that right? Like, well, I don't know if it was annihilated or destroyed. I don't, who knows? But it, you know what? This is the interesting part. So these are the moon mysteries. Whatever was was cert, was orbiting the Earth before us, before that um, moon, was far smaller than mm -hmm. what we have today. We have one of the most relatively large moons. If you look at it, it's one of the largest moons in the solar system. And one of the largest moons in reference to the size of our Earth that we've ever seen. Wow. It, it's, it's, it's not natural. So we have this giant moon, which is in a tidal lock around the earth. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> it is almost nearly circular in orbit. That's something we don't see naturally occurring. So if you look at, they call it the semi-major and the semi-minor axes, you know, when you when you look at the the actual center center point of the rotation of 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 the or the orbit, you look at the center point, the semi major and semi minor axes are extremely close. Semi major the longest distance, semi minor the shortest distance. It's extremely close. They're within they're within a fraction of a degree. That's almost a circle. Now it's slightly elliptical, but that's almost a circle. And so it takes a, it, it, we suspect it takes a lot of energy to maintain that circle. The other weird thing is it rotates like a chronometer, like a clock. It rotates about every 28 plus 27 plus days. So wow. we, we can use it to tell time. It's always been there. So time is an element of this tidal lock that exists. We're imprisoned within a time frame. Is that what you mean by tidal lock? Well, you can think about a tidal lock as the tides. Yes. A very powerful energy, which is pulling and releasing and pulling in different directions. That's a tidal lock. So we're, we're in this tidal lock and it's very, very rigidly controlling time. And the other thing that it's doing is it's creating karma. Mm. Now, I can keep going. Maybe I should just keep going. I don't know. Um, go ahead, ask a question. It might help. Well, I, I'm more or less integrating because we we've talked about many things, but we talked about the Christ and the convergence coming into one single point, and we talked about the polarity, you know, being a oneness, being of both genders, and then that splitting out from each other, becoming less whole, becoming more separated parts and polarities inside ourselves that probably also somehow dovetail into this tidal pulling that, you know, creates behaviors and thoughts and all these things that keep us in these perpetual cycles of karma that keep us in this prison planet, right? Yes. And, and this is the deeper cosmology and the vibrations behind all the lives we've lived. Some people listening to this thinking, what, yes. we've lived multiple times, but right. right when you have this pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling, you're never going anywhere. That's the treadmill, right? right. It's the wheel of karma. It's the wheel of karma. Right. right, right. So, so right. So, the, so these energies are, are affecting the soul. So, um, the way that we can describe is where we can say, in summary, that 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 before, let's say, the sexes were cleaved, at least before that point, and when we could we could create things at will, um, we didn't have this influence over us, and then we had a flourishing society and then things got really bad and we more or less almost annihilated the world. We almost annihilated the world in a massive flood, right? And 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 so much so that they said that the, the, the earth was knocked 
its axis was was affected and all these other things that we killed about 90 percent of life on, on this world so we were taught a lesson <clears throat> we decided collectively that we we're going to take this journey into um into a, a a world that separated us from spiritual guidance from from the authority of the father <clears throat> and so we descended into the realm the darker realm and there were fallen angels apparently that were present that were more than happy to oh, usurp sure. themselves and into the role of of, of mentor of the mentors or the father god figures right who created within them a hierarchy now at the beginning it probably was good and the reason why i say that is because in in in, in esoteric teachings you have the symbol symbol of the pyramid and it says out of chaos um you know manifest order or, is, or comes order right so that was the model of these and you know we, we can imagine what it was like after after the the massive catastrophe everything was in chaos and so the, this Satur saturnian energy along with i think in conjunction with the moon's tidal lock was used in order for us to start developing an appreciation for rules and for time and, and for all these other things that, you know, you could say what you want about Saturn, which is very draconian in nature, but you know what? It gets crap done. You know, it, 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 it's, it's taught us to be punctual. It's taught us to be honest. It's taught us to be forthright. It's taught us to show up and it's taught us to follow through with our convictions, which is what we needed to do. Right. But it's, 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 it's past its time now. Now, now it's been hijacked and usurped by these other energies that have perverted it. And now we, we need to move on beyond the control of hierarchy. They say that what comes after, first you have anarchy, then you have a hierarchy. What comes after hierarchy is, well, in the old system, anarchy. You went through, through hierarchy to anarchy to hierarchy. To, these, these cycles never ended. Well, the push and the pull continues to play right. itself out. Well, what comes after that is synarchy. Synarchy is when everything is synchronistically connected to itself and the law of oneness is reinstated. So we're on the verge of moving into synarchy. Also, when we now become whole, when we become more whole, and when we understand that we, we actually have to reverse the flow of, of consciousness. And then maybe if I have time, I'll get to that, what that means. So we are, we're moving in that direction, but could you imagine what happened when we were these carefree beings that always had the capacity to do what we wanted to co-create with the realities of the universe. Then it really went awry and we almost blew the whole thing up. We almost burned down the house. So we, these draconian energies were sent in to teach us a lesson, which we more or less gave our consent for. And so they went after us and they enslaved us. Now, I'm not gonna say there's any good or bad to any of this because there's good in everything. Um, and we have a lot of resentment for what happened, but this is what happened. Um, and I just, a little, little caveat to that is that so many people that's really unconscious to them they don't even know that they're resentful and bitter because they don't they are they've, they've lost the language and they're acting out that bitterness and that resentment in the separation behaviors we see absolutely right right so so what happened was um was that these beings came in and um, we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, so to speak, right? Or we could also make some other references. We can go into the, we can go into the um, the mythologies of, um, of of Genesis and 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 our creational mythologies. What's very interesting is that um, if you look at the creational mythologies, especially the Gnostic writings, you know <clears throat> where Eve comes from from unity consciousness to separation consciousness. She, in, in, in the Bible, it says she's, she comes from Adam's rib. She didn't come from the rib, she came from his heart. She manifested from his heart. And what manifested from Adam was his angel or his higher self as he saw her within himself. Uh -huh. That became a physical manifestation, that's what it says. 
Wow. So he manifested. Or it was manifested in that fashion. So right. It, right. But now, this, this higher version, this like higher dimensional consciousness manifested into Eve. That was the intention, it sounds like. Yeah, yes, yes and no. So what's really interesting is, is that, um, is that when human beings are being created, okay, you know, and, and there's, you know, there's a lot of different stories about how, how human beings were created. Um, in the Gnostic writings, it says that the Sophia, which is the divine feminine, put within the human soul, something called the Zoe, mm -hmm. which means the life, the life force. Wow. But there was something else that existed within it, which is called the epinoia. And that was also placed within us by, by these divine feminine and these divine beings. So they put within us the epinoia, epinoia. And this epinoia or epinoia is interesting because it means literally um, a higher mind. Mm, okay. Wow. So what is it? And the answer to that is, and I wrestled with this for a long, 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 long time. I wrestled with this for so long because I couldn't figure it out. And the, and the thing is, is that you can't ascribe any genders to any of these things, otherwise it really confuses us, but we can, but we can't. Keep in mind, there's two epinoias within two higher minds within us. And it's right there in Genesis. It says, placed within the Garden of Eden was a tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. That's the epinoias. They're in there. That's what that means. Those are those trees. Wow. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil is logo synergies. It's the masculine higher mind. Mm -hmm. And the and the tree of life is the feminine, the divine feminine. It's the divine feminine mind or the heart, right? That's what's in us. Okay, so those those energies were placed within us all this time. And so if you want to understand what the epinoia was, that's what it was. Now, at some point, we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? Because <laughs> this is how this is how it's explained. And I'm just going to kind of merge some different stories together. But um, we were tempted by a serpent, right? And that serpent could be interpreted as Lucifer, it could be interpreted as ego. It could also be interpreted as a being called Lilith. Mm. Lilith is a very interesting being. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about Lilith. So Lilith is um, the divine uh, feminine. And it's an element of the, the tree of life. <clears throat> and you mentioned this. So I really got excited because I listened to your lectures, your last transmission this morning twice, actually. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to miss anything. And in that, you did talk about life force. You mentioned life force. I found that it was really exciting when you mentioned life force. And what's being coveted right now by the serpent is are these life force. This is our, our life force, right? So, so life force is also called libido. Mm -hmm. That's libido is our life force, right? And so... <clears throat> There are mythologies related to Lilith. And Lilith is an interesting mythology because it's not in any of the sacred, I mean, it's in some of the texts, but it's not in any of the canonical texts. So Lilith was Adam's first wife, as the mythologies tell us. Wow. And, and so Adam was given a wife and it was Lilith. And um, he didn't like her. They, they, didn't, they did not see eye to eye. Neither were they energetically compatible. Wow. Now, there is some profound information from this. Um, when they tried to have sex or when they tried to copulate or, or create a, a sexual union, she refused to subject herself to him. Wow. So she refused to, to have sex with him from an from a uh, inferior position. And so she insisted that she was in a superior position. Oh. And this infuriated Adam. He just couldn't relate to her. And she infuriated Lilith to the point where she raged about this. And she left the garden. And so when, well, allegedly when God said, hey, how's it going with your new wife? 
He said, not very well. And told him, he told him the story. He says, okay, well, we'll get you a different one. <laughs> so, and, so, and so Eve was presented to him as a second wife who was much more subservient to Adam. Mm. Now, Interesting. this to me has a reference to the flow of divine consciousness. Mm. At one time it flew, it was flowing through. It is always still is divine feminine, but they tried to reverse things so that they made the conscious, the, the flow of divine consciousness from masculine to feminine instead of from feminine to masculine. Mm. But when it flows from masculine to feminine, and it, for a long time it was flowing from masculine to feminine, there were ages where the divine um, divine consciousness or masculine consciousness was flowing from a from a paternal form of God mm. through laws and through scriptures and through these. But it doesn't work anymore. So at the, maybe for the time it worked, but this is what happened to Lilith. Lilith raged. She went. She went crazy. She raged out of the garden, and 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 uh, so we can say that at some point we we left the Garden of Eden. Whether it was Lilith who convinced Adam and Eve to eat the apple, or whether or not, you know, who knows? But, but Lilith was part of the life force. Right. Lilith is the life force because the life force is sexual energy. So Lilith rages and she goes out into the wilderness and she consorts with all kinds of archons and demons and demiurges and she is habitually abused and um, used and cast out into the gutter and uh, usurped and all of these other things. Um, and so if you look at the Gnostics description of the divine feminine, which was Sophia. What happens to Sophia in the writings of Sophia is the same thing. Really? Yes. Now, because she created a reality without the help of the divine logos. And this reality that she created was the creator God or the usurping God of all of these energies. And, and that the creation that she made came back and usurped her and subjugated her. So it's the same story and only it's on a bigger, broader perspective. From a lower perspective, this is what happened to the human soul. One of the ways, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, just as you were describing what happened with Lilith and it sounds like that's mirrored in what happened to Sophia, right? Yes. Yeah. When Christ, when Jesus shows up 2,000 years ago or so, you know, of course, we have distorted stories about a lot of that, but some of, there's truth in there, too. And isn't that what happened with Mary Magdalene is how they described her as this being who's either a prostitute or abused or a combination of those things. But yeah. then he sees who she is and he resets her. Yes. Is that the resetting attempt to reset Lilith? Yeah, that's, that's another slightly larger macrocosm into our small microcosm. That is so amazing that you, you, you brought that up. No one else would have been able to see that, but that's exactly what that was. And, you know, Magdalene and Jesus, they were, without them, we wouldn't be where we're at today. And I mean that in the most positive way. Right. And, and, and so she was just as much, and we won't have time to discuss this in the details that it deserves, but she was just as much part of his ministry than he, as, as he was himself. Yes. But she wasn't in the forefront. Now, this is how important his ministry was. It would have, it would never would have survived without two people. The first person was John the Baptist because he recognized Jesus for who he was. And so he baptized him. Right. Then he was killed. And the other person was Mary Magdalene. Why? Because she anoints him as the true king. Right. She anoints him. And if you read the text, it says that it was- And she's Mary receptive to Magdalene. the true father power. It was Mary Magdalene, the sister of Lazarus, who anointed Jesus. 
And that's who she was. She was she was a sister of Martha, Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, and there was a fourth daughter. Really? Fourth child. Yeah, her, but she doesn't really amount to much. She was kind of like a simple child, and her name was Mary also. And so, so, but 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 that's now if you really want to get into the esoteric nature of who Magdalene was, she was Solomon. She was the King Solomon, the wisest person in the scriptures. That's who Magdalene was. That's this a soul was. incarnate. Yes. If you really understand that, then you can interpret something else that Jesus said. When he said that, he said that wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. This is one of my favorite passages. He says that wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And what the heck does he mean by that? He means that she anointed him. That was her deed. That was her ultimate deed, to recognize the true king within this realm. Now, they definitely were a couple. And I don't want to go into the dynamics of it, but I would love to at some point be able to go into the details of that. They were, they were, they were a couple. And, and they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they formed a sacred union. Um, and so Magdalene, um, the, the story of Solomon is interesting. Solomon, um, he had over, he had hundreds of wives and he had hundreds of concubines. He had a giant harem. And he was trying to come to the divine feminine with his principal wife through sex magic. This is all in the, this is all in the scriptures if you read it. He's also the wisest man in, 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 in that, we, that the world had ever seen. So he knew all of these things, but he was trying to come to, to, to divine feminine through sex magic principles. And in the process of doing this, he brought in a lot of entities and entity attachments and possessions into his soul. Wow. So he Feels was reminiscent of Lilith too. Right, right. So he was incarnated at some point later, the soul was incarnated as Magdalene. Wow. And so Magdalene, yeah, I don't think she was a prostitute as much as she was a Lilith character. Yes. An enchantress character. A woman that no man could control. Absolutely not. But every single man was slain by her. They all desired her. She was magnificently beautiful. That's what Lilith is. And so she finally does meet Jesus and he does see the demons within her. And he has to cure her twice. He casts out seven devils from her twice before they create a union. That's how the, that's how the story goes. But he, and, and, and how important was she to his ministry? She was the most important element to his ministry. And it, there's actually kind of a hilarious passage where... <laughs> where the apostles are coming to him and they're going, why do you love her more than us? That's what they asked him. And he's like, he was almost like joking with them. He's like, you gotta be the same for asking a question. So here's my answer. He said, if you took a person who was blind and a person who had sight, you put them in a dark room, they're both can't see. But when the light shows up in the room, the person with sight can see. And she was the only person on the in the world who had sight enough to see who he was you see so um wow. so there's so 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 she's just instrumental in all of this lilith is like a smaller version of our libido of our of 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 our of our of our energy so what lilith represents and now there's different beings there's kali in the eastern um traditions who is a, an enchantress, divine enchantress, and Shiva-like energies that she's actually the wife of Shiva, destruction and sex, sexual energy. There's Hecate, there's Lilith, there's Kirke. Kirke is one of my favorites. She's, um, she's, a, she's a Greek goddess. There's Persephone. And if we have time, we can talk about Persephone, who's the moon goddess. But what happens is that Lilith is important for a number of reasons. The major reason Lilith is important is, it, number one, she's connected to Genesis. Number two 
is that there's astrology that's related to her. So it's having an effect upon us at all times. Well, well I just, I've never paid attention, but in the word Genesis, there's also our genes. Like our genetic codes originate yeah. from all that yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. And you know, she doesn't really appear in Genesis per se. She appears within the same mythologies that, that it was all based upon. So she's in like folklore before Genesis even exists, but that's her, that's the Lilith energy. But now we have astrological um, energies that, it, you know, this, this is a term, it's called abracadabra. It's a barbarous word. It means I create as I speak it. Mm, wow. I create as I speak it. So that's what, that's what abra, and a barbarous word just means you phonetically write it out. You can write it out or spell it any way you want. But abracadabra, that's what it means. I create it as I speak it. And, and so we were able to create these things, you know? And so it's one of these beautiful things in astrology is that we find something new out there that is now part of our consciousness. And we contemplate it and we have meetings and we, we, we try to find the most appropriate name. It's like naming a child, the most appropriate name for this celestial body. And once we, once we name it, we, in, we, we put intention into it. Mm. And so it starts to function within our consciousness in the intention, in the spirit of how we named it. It takes on the personality, it takes on that role. So this is a prime example of how we can co-create our own reality. But again, we have to work with the energies because this is how the spiritual realm works with us. It works through this interface between the signatures within the heavens and how we inter interact with all of it. So Lilith, go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, there's so much to talk about, but I love what we're talking about and we'll come back because there's volumes upon volumes of things that we could share. But it's interesting. There's truth and there's like a cloudiness in just about anything. And that's how the serpent or the Lilith energy distorts truth for its own ends, for its own purposes. But as I'm listening and I zoom out of our conversation again, there's this returning to unification with source, which is this singular point, this union, right? Yeah. And yet what we're talking about also, there's all these other consciousnesses that got in the act in our world, right? So you have the Sophia, you have the Lilith, you have Adam, you have Eve, you have the serpent, you have all, and all the mentor guides since Atlantis, you well, know. Everything would be good until you, the fallen angels got involved, but yes, keep going. Right, so a lot of people, I mean, this is my question, but I know you may have many more things to say. And I know you also have a graph. I don't know if we're going to put that up on the screen yeah. if we're okay. getting there. But I just want to say, I know some people don't know they're in crisis. Some people don't know they're having a crisis of faith, but they can see their own behavior if they would zoom out and say, do I look and act like a happy person? Do I feel like a person who's living the Garden of Eden in my life? And if we're not, that's one of the greatest indications that you are living some version of separation and pain and suffering and the enslavement cycle. Right. And when we wake up to realize that we're living this on this hamster wheel, we want to reconnect and we go through this crisis of faith. We have an awareness of that crisis and it bursts a new desire to connect. It bursts a new desire to come into union. And I know for me in a lot of the languages, it's unifying with source, unifying with God, unifying with the ultimate creator and, and um, you know, going through a process, the hero's journey in some ways to uh, collapse all the false beliefs and release all of that and just come into harmony in the union again. But it's interesting that there are all these other players that have these investments in our consciousness, in our DNA, in our genetics, in our story, right? And here we are in this revelation times. And it's just interesting when you think about the Magdalene characters and all the characters you brought it into play today, they're influencing our consciousness largely unconsciously most of the time until we wake up. And I just, I wonder, I know you have more things to say, and this might be multiple podcasts to talk about this because this is the ultimate question. How do you get back 
in union with source beyond all this, these clouds and smog and pushes and pulls and karmic cycles. And that's the dance we're doing, right? But here are the floods. We're in the flood season of just about all of it. Well, well, the astrology is forced to reckon with this. I mean, this is what I've been writing about since the beginning of the year. We are going to have to face our most painful and primal wound, and that's Lilith. This is how Lilith. This is where Lilith is. It, it plays into this, and you can't escape it. So, so we're either victims or we're, vic, or we're victimizers, mm -hmm. and that's really where, where Lilith, because Lilith. Lilith is, is a victim, but Lilith is also an, um, a dark occultist. That, uh, 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 she uses her sexuality as a weapon, mm. um, and, and, and she uses her charms to enchant, and she uses her um, unions with demonic beings and, and dark beings um, who are the same ones who have been usurping her. She creates alliances with them. And she wow. tries to she tries to play the game with them. That's the human soul. Until you get to the point where you realize that you'll never be free within that construct, and neither are the demons or fallen angels. They're all enslaved to the system. Right. So, right. So once, and this is what happens to 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 Sophia. The same thing happens to Sophia. She is. She has usurped and raped and debauched and debased and all the same thing happens to the human soul, right? But we fight against it out there in the wilderness. We're separated now from the rest of who we were. Our libido is the most coveted thing that human beings possess and has been withdrawn from us. It has been stripped the human consciousness and the human soul. The, there's nothing more than the usurping demonic draconian energies, globalist energies want is your libido. That's the most precious thing that you have. Isn't it amazing that if I try to talk about certain truths regarding <clears throat> uh, um, improprieties within the government, improprieties within the pharmaceutical industry, improprieties with the, with the injection, I'm censored, right. but if I want to look for deviant pornography or bestiology, it's really, really available. Uh, it's, it's, it's at my fingertips. Yes. Right. So that's part of the conditioning. It's part of this distortion. It's part of the mind control. It is destroying. It's usurping your libido energies, right? We're putting all of our libido. Truth energy is the libido. That's part of the creationary energies. So if yes. they hide the truth, you can access your own yes. life force, but they can access you. Yes, libido is creational energy. It's sexual in nature, but it ascends along and uh, everything that we do is to a certain degree has, has, is, 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 has a sexual polarity to it to a certain degree. It just, that's how it is. Um, and um, so, so, so that energy is a life force. But once they hijack it, once they usurp it, once they dumb you down with drugs, and once they dumb you down with injections, and once they dumb you down with, 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 with uh, sexual deviation through electronic, you know, platforms, and once they dumb you down into uh, or distort or destroy your sexual polarities into genderless, you know, um, um, and that's something that's happening right now in the genderless forms, binary genderless, or what is non-sexual binary non-genderless forms. I mean, that's part of the destruction of the libido. That's all there for us to see. And so, so the thing that the globalist and the thing that, 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 that hierarchy fears the most is your libido because mm -hmm. your, your, <clears throat> Liberation wow. will come through it. It is dependent upon it. And if you don't have it, you're a dead person. You're, you have no life force within you. So how this all works out yeah. is through how we can understand it is through astrology. In astrology, there is a, an asteroid called Lilith. And there's also a position within 
the heavens, which is very close to us, which is the what they call the apogee of um, of the moon's of the moon's orbit. I'll show this to you in a minute. And that apogee is the furthest point away from the moon's furthest point away from the Earth. It's a mathematical position, okay. <clears throat> which can be calculated in astrology. We calculate mathematical positions all the time. We look at nodes of planets, nodes of the moon. We and there's something else, and that something else is called dark. No, it's called Black Moon Lilith. So it's real confusing. There's Lilith, there's Dark Moon Lilith, and then there's something called Black Moon Lilith. Now, Black Moon Lilith is what we like to look at in astrology. And it's a position. And it has everything to do with the energies of the moon. So, so this is just an example of, of, of what basically Black Moon Lilith is. And Black Moon Lilith is a position within the heavens. And it's the closest position that exists to <clears throat> our human soul. All right. And so what it is, 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 is that you see the moon, the moon circulates around. I don't know, it's, can you see this if I'm doing this? Yes. All right. So you have the moon and it, at its furthest point away from the earth, that's what the apogee, that's what we call Dark Moon Lilith. And then we have something called Black Moon Lilith. Now, the, as I mentioned before, the, the orbit of the moon around the Earth is nearly circular, but it's not. It's still an elliptical orbit, but it's very, very, very circular. But if you were to look at the center point of any elliptical orbit, there's generally two foci. There's two focal points. That's, you know, if you had one focal point, you got a circle. If you start separating the focal points out, you start creating an ellipt elliptical orbit. The further out they go, the more elliptical it is. So there's two focal points to an ellipse, or, uh, elliptical orbit. So our, our orbit is extremely circular, but not quite. So there are two focal points. They're very close. The second focal point is only 36,000 kilometers away from the Earth's center. It's and the Earth's the Earth's diameter is you know I, I don't know it is about like ten thousand kilometers or something like that so it's not that far away from the surface of the Earth it's like a shadow of the Earth right right it's like a shadow of the Earth right and 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 so there's something about astrology which is very interesting the Moon is what we call a luminary energy. It's just as powerful, almost as powerful as the sun. I was gonna, I felt that when you first started talking about the sons of suns, I thought, I guess, is the moon? The moon is a powerful. It's huge. It has huge effects upon human beings. Interestingly, in holistic medicine, the moon controls circadian rhythms and it causes, re, and it controls reproductive cycles, libido energies. Okay. Right? Not, so, so it's, it's very cool. So, so the, the moon is a luminary. And it turns out that if you have something that's very close to a luminary in conjunction with a luminary, it's so close you can't see it because the powers are so powerful. It drowns it all out. So it's, it's a classic example of what we call something that's hiding in plain sight. Wow. Which is what dark moon Lilith is. It's a shadow. Um, Which is what darkness is on this yeah. planet. It hides in plain yeah. sight. Yes. So dark moon Lilith is really the, the, the human, the shadow of the human soul. Because the moon itself is involved in what they call a draconian cycle or a lunar cycle. Now, in a lunar cycle, which is a moon cycle, a lunar cycle around the earth, it, it, um, it, it, um, it has, it's, it's, it's drawn as a dragon or a serpent. And it has a head and a tail to it. And one is called the North Node, the other one's called the South Node. And I don't want to get into all the details of that. But what it does is it captures all the karmic energies that we accrue or amass throughout our existence, throughout this experience of linear time since the moon was established. And it all amasses within 
our shadow, or what we call our doppelganger, which is a manifestation or the summation of our egotistical soul. So does that make so sense? So are these, and that was the dark moon you just said? Is that, 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 so Lilith is associated with all of it. Lilith's associated with all of it, but like the black moon Lilith right. is a container for, yes. see, describe the dark moon and the black moon Lilith again. So let's just focus on black moon. Just black moon. The black moon is the shadow. Okay. So it is the container for all of those transgressions that we've amassed. It is our doppelganger. It is our, our dark egotistical energies. That's where it exists. It exists within um, an aspect or a shadow of, of the moon, which is really, I think, really we don't go to the moon or we don't interface with the moon. We interface with the second focal point. If you were to look at a human being when a human being goes to sleep and you were to look at the human being from an from the perspective of the aura, the aura changes when you're asleep. And, it, and it's like the aura, the body lets go of the aura and the aura, it, 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 it changes its nature to the physical body. So you can look, if you are a clairvoyant, you can look at a person and you can look at the aura and you can tell whether they're sleeping because they're, they're, certain energies have withdrawn from the physical body. And where do they go? And where the answer is, is they go into the shadow realm. They go into the astral realm, which is the realm of Black Moon Lilith. It's, the, it's what the title lock has created. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a artificial construct of consciousness, not necessarily the physical moon, but the physical moon is playing a part in this, but it is the astral realm as we know it. So can I ask a question? Because I'm right there with you, but I, I, you know, of course, feel everything you're saying vibrationally. Is this because of the whole Lilith, Adam and Eve? Of course, Atlantis was in there, but, um, you know, this whole thing that Atlantis was after Adam and Eve, but still, is, did, have we created sort of this container? Is that like a, a container of all of our unresolved consciousness that as we ascend, it will disappear? No, it won't disappear. It'll never disappear. <laughs> That's the best part. No, no, it, 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 won't, it won't go away. It is embedded within this is the summation of all of your transgressions, all of your limitations, all of your dark shadows, it's in there. So in order for you to, to ascend, you have to confront it. Oh, I you see. To, you have to confront it. But it, so, that doesn't necessarily mean in the confronting, you're trying to eradicate it. It just means you are you have, facing, it. you have to integrate it. Integrate it. Right. And that's where Lilith comes in. So, so Lilith, and this is, this is where, so in astrology and the psychology associated with astrology is just fantastic and interesting. There's three different positions or three different manifestations of Lilith. So not to try to confuse you, but I'll try to clarify this a little bit. The asteroid Lilith, which we don't follow, we don't follow in astrology really <clears throat> dark moon Lilith. If you want to look it up, you can. That's this apogee that's over here. And, um, but we like to look at black moon Lilith. Okay, so in, in black moon Lilith, um, that's really kind of the summation of all the Lilith energies. Oh, all right. So that's really where the doppelganger and the shadow goes. And so it's, it's understood in astrology and it's understood within, um, within the psychology of this thing that black, moon Lil the, that black moon Lilith is the summation of all of it. So you don't have to follow the other ones. Black moon Lilith is where you want to focus your attentions on. Wow. And so if you were to look at this, and I'm just going to stop the share right here, okay? Sure. If we, if we were to look at this from, from a psychological perspective, Lilith in its raw state represents the libido as it rages outside of the garden or outside of the unification of the human soul. It leaves and it's driven by and consorts with and 
has a relationship with the same archons that that have caused all the problems in the first place right and so uh, we've gone through ages of this ages of abuse ages of abusing ages of all of this and this is where all of these transgressions have amassed within the dark shadow of, of who we are within our lilith right mm -hmm. it's it's all there and if you were to meet lilith as an archetype outside of you it's devastating for for a man at least devastatingly attractive but it's the femme fatale it, it will wipe it's you lethal off. it's lethal. also lethal and there are many women who are playing that role right and and so and and and, and so so that's an unresolved conflict that has to come to resolution now now they say that that's the first stage is going through all these transgressions and living and we talked about this as a person who's either a player or getting played and you live ages like this until you're sick of it and then once you're sick of it you start to withdraw now where lilith withdraws is called dark moon lilith that's the apogee and now she's in she's in a dark place where it's like a sanctuary where she, all of the processing has to occur mm -hmm. it has to occur within this dark matrix or cave or wherever she, she's withdrawn she's no longer participating in the game but now she's trying to heal herself from all of the wounds and trying to make sense of what's happening many of us are in that position now right but black moon lilith is integration black moon lilith is lilith coming back to zoe black moon lilith is 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 coming back and claiming your libido sexual energies is having control of it again you are no longer going to allow the the earth usurpers and the draconian beings to feast off of it she's integrating back in and quite frankly she's a powerful force she is a she is she is a powerful and intelligent force it is the divine feminine Think of Lilith as the divine feminine, unbridled, hmm. and un and and unres and, and just 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 completely. I mean, what would happen to you if these draconian forces came in and you knew better? Part of you would dissociate, and that's what this is. It's a dissociative trauma that happened to all of us. This is the primary injury, a dissociative trauma. I mean, and there's other amazing channelers who just, who, who've addressed this in much more detailed ways, but in some ways it's described as almost an invasion by these really dark negative energies that, that wiped out kingdoms and, and established hierarchy. At, and, and it was so traumatic that some of these kings, these, these ascended kings, went into stasis and allegedly they're going to come out of stasis in these times. But in order to survive what was happening and their, their kingdoms were wiped out and their, their, and their families were destroyed and their, and their queens were, were, were raped and debauched and all of these things. This may have happened, I don't know. But it's the, myth, the, it's the, it's the mythology of what happened. That's very interesting. So we all went through dissociative trauma, right? It's DID, right? Dissociative right. identity disorder. Identity disorder, right? And when that's what happens, when we are abused to such a high degree that the only survival mechanism left is to dissociate. They do this to children. This is, the, this is something that came from the Atlantean experience and it was coveted by the Egyptians and it was coveted by um, the occultists when they, when, they, when they found out about it again. And it's coveted by the Nazis and it was coveted by the dark occultists practicing all over and it's still coveted today and very active today. So if you want to really destroy somebody, you traumatize them <clears throat> in childhood. Yes. And you destroy their soul. You, 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 just, you, you fracture their soul. And they have, a, they have a wound that never heals. And so, that, so this is what happens and this is what's happened to all of us. And so what was driven out of us is what they coveted. It was our libido. And we have to we have to claim ownership of that again. We have to integrate that back into our nature, into our soul. And that's what Black Moon that's what Black Moon Lilith is all about. That's what I mean by integrating the ego back into the soul. 
because you know you can't you can't negate it. You cannot you cannot turn your back on these powerful energies that drives that drives us. It's the most important energies that we hold on this on, in this physical life. So it's it has the greatest to, light is the greatest darkness, right? Which is why we avoid it, but we also never achieve integration with our light. Yes, we were afraid of the darkness. And so, you know, there's dark stuff in it. You're going to have to face that. But remember, anytime you're faced with these, with these realities now and you see it manifesting and reflecting in others, you tell the universe, you tell that person, thank you for showing me what I no longer resonate with or who no longer choose to be a part yes, of. Yes, Paul, right? exactly. So, but that's, that's preventing people from going into the darkness. Because <clears throat> why is it dark? It's not just negative stuff that's in there. It's your most precious possession that's in there. That's where it's hidden. It's hidden in that darkness. And that has to be rescued. It has to be integrated. So when they, when they said that the, we have this <clears throat> tree of life within us and the Zoe was placed within us by the divine Sophia, she is the perfect manifestation of all of the feminine elements. But then... Lilith was driven out of her, the, that darker libido energy was driven out of her, and then we had some, some kind of a muted form of that through Eve. But, but the name means the mother of all things. And so, but the libido is the life force. It's, it's that sexual energy. And yes, it can be dark, but you know what? That's part of who we are. And, it, and as long as you're not being malicious, and as long as you're not using it to destroy, but using it to build and to protect and to enhance, and to, and, to, and to use it in co-creation and in cooperation, then you, you damn well have to understand it. You have to harness that energy because that is the creational energy. You know, look up at the Sistine Chapel or look at the great paintings from the Renaissance and you know what you're going to find in the paint? Semen is in oh. the paint. It was oh. mixed in paint. Oh. Yes. That's what they did. They were they they were they were practitioners of the mystery. I'm telling you right now, that's what that's that is a fact. And so 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 this is this is this is this is this is where that energy comes from. They harness that libido energy. Okay, this is any artist knows this. Okay, and so so you you have to understand that this is it's not that we're going to negate the ego. It's not that we're going to become. Um, you know, binary beings that are asexual. Well, it's going to be the opposite. We're going no, to no, exactly. We're going to ride. That's we're going the to, agenda to work us into these binary asexual uh, beings. But right. that would shut down all that was given to us in our divine gifts, right? And the luminescent light and life force inside us, right? And that's what these times are. You know, I was also thinking, Paul, you described that so beautifully. That's just so rich with so much energy. But when you go into the darkness, it is with purposeful heroism or purposeful avatarism. Like that's the slaying of the dragons also in all of our mythology of like, we have to go rescue the damsel in distress in our own way. And that's the wounded Lilith inside all of us, right? That we're the knight and the damsel all in one, but we have to be the one that goes and faces those things and climbs the tower, right? And, and all the symbology of all of that, but that's these times and, and we can't heal what we can't see. And so also with the censoring, with you, you just brought that up too, is you can't talk about the truth, right? So if they can keep shutting down what the truth is, they can keep you from discovering the light that's the hidden treasure in the whole thing. And we have passion and power, but it's been so muted down. And the, some people who seek these things, they don't live to tell the story because some force of the matrix, you know, takes them out of the game basically, right? They don't want the revealers, hence what happened to Christ, as an example, hence what happened to Jesus. They don't want people illuminating things. They like the shroud of darkness, right? But see, and we haven't gotten to this today, and maybe we can talk about this as, as we round out today, but I know there's so many more conversations to have, is the floods, the floodwaters now, this biblical time 
I don't know if you can weave that into the astrology or just what's in your heart to say about that. But when you have been talking since January about this crucifixion energy of like your worst fears will come into your awareness, the things we haven't wanted to see are coming up into our individual and collective consciousness. They must be faced. But what that means to me is they must be seen so that you can bring the light to them so that they can be released, cleansed, healed, and or integrated, right? There's this whole process going on. And because we've been so conditioned in that DID in our own way, right, through time, like a dissociative quality to ourselves where we forget who we are, we don't remember our past lives, we don't remember our themes and our patterns and why they keep showing up again. They seem to have, they have no connection whatsoever. They're all isolated incidents that have no deeper, bigger picture. We get lost in that, um, but now is the time that I think God's creating some moments here where, where God sent in his son of sons 2000 years ago. I think God is present here now. And I think there's gonna be some very biblical events and they're happening now. You see the flood waters, you see, it's like the whole matrix is cracking, right? The whole illusion can't hold itself up indefinitely. And as more people, because I do think it's in the cycle. This We're going into this new age of 2000 years of peace, right? And amazing things, but the whole other world has to crumble. So we birth into this new experience, right? And it is going to be like, I use the word epic. It is an epic level of, we won't return. There's nothing to sustain or maintain of what this has been. I think God's hands are in this moment as we move and the old closes out, which it already has been closing out for some time. But the final crumbles are like this crescendo right now. We're in it. So I'm curious if, you know, what you want to say about that from whatever perspective you want to speak. I don't know if it's about the astrology, about this, this moment of, you, you said a crucifixion recently in a round table that, 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 um, what was it the solstice that you 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 know all the things that you were seeing it's like and we're the ones being crucified and that's this moment of facing this great darkness inside ourselves coming to terms with that and maybe it's the dark moon lilith that's like needs to integrate that you know we're, we have this work cut out for all of us right so so yes at the summer solstice they were they were they were i i'm i'm just amazed that there really wasn't a lot of people. I don't think I saw anyone talk about it, which, which really made me concerned. So I went back and looked and I looked and I looked and yeah, it was there. The grand um, cross, right. And all of that. But, you know, I mean, y- there's not a lot of things written in astrology regarding the grand cross because it is an arduous, an arduous, um, let's say symbol or an arduous energy and uh, oppositions when you have planets that are opposition to themselves, that causes a lot of tension. Mm. You have op- when you have uh, energies that are squared at a 90 degree square to themselves, that causes a lot of confrontation. But when you have two oppositions squaring each other, oh, they just throw up their hands and they go, it's just, just, just let's let this thing pass, whatever it is. And instead of realizing that it's an energy that we have to face and, and we have to harness, and and so so there's nothing bad in astrology if you if you if you look at it from a mundane perspective, which means mundane is an interesting word. It's also connected to secular, and secular is related to time. Mm. The term secular was a reference uh, to a reference of of a, of a period of linear time. The mundane is connected to that also. So secular, mundane. Um, and there is a such thing as a mundane astrology where people want to look at it from their personal perspective to, to see, oh, this is a bad time for me to start a business or I'm going to, you know, inherit money or, or, you know, I shouldn't get this surgery done. That's mundane astrology. And if you were to look at the perspectives of what's going on from that lower perspective, all hell's breaking loose right now. The world is, is falling apart. You said this in your transmission. You said the sky is falling. Hmm. It, it is. is in that oh. perspective it's falling and there's truth in that chicken little wasn't crazy right but it was also the distorted lilith too that was seeing it the way that she was 
Right. Well, you know, yes. So, so that, yes, Lilith has, has not been integrated or, or even addressed or even acknowledged yet. So, but in a higher perspective, we would say that, look, we're, we're children of our spiritual parents mm -hmm. and that we're here for a reason. And it, it's not going to be to die over some stupid virus or injection, or I'm not going to starve to death, you know, and, you know, because they ran out of burrito wrappers or something like that. And, or, or, you know, I can't buy a car because, you know, they, they don't have the, 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 the chips that, you know, that no one just wants to make to create an artificial source. I mean, all of this is crap. All of it is BS. So, so if you, if you can ascend your consciousness into a higher plane, you understand that you're children of your living parents, you're here for a reason. It's not to get caught up in all of this, the machinations of all of these mundane and ordinary things. So look at it at a bigger perspective. That's what they call transpersonal astrology or astrology that, that goes beyond the personal and integrative process a spiritual level and that's something that I would love to talk about at some point down the road relating to how I can how we can integrate astrology to alchemy mm -hmm. which is which is what we call the yoga of the Gnostics to scripture it does exist it's extremely important to understand this and no one's ever spoken about it I've actually working on an essay I've actually worked on a video on this and it'll be released within the next, within the, maybe the end of the weekend, or, or probably by the time this is released, it'll be available. But uh, it's really important to try to learn how to integrate those energies. And so, so yes, there's, there's, there's a perception of hardship that we're facing, and everything is going to be transformed. Um, but it will not, and, and, I, and this is my big question I have, is that if you really want to ascend, do you think you could do it without going through these hardships, without facing your karma? And the answer is no way. It's never going to happen. So you can continuously run away, and many people are to the point of inoculating themselves with poison, to the point where they may no longer be able to ascend into a higher state of consciousness based on the poison that they're being injected with. That may be part of it. It's not just that. It's not just a physical poison. It's all the technology that, it, that supports it that's poison. And so their consciousness is trapped within a virtual matrix that will not allow them to leave those physical confines. And quite frankly, people in that situation, they might look at astrology but never be able to to, to see it beyond a mundane perspective, if they even consider it at all. So it's people that have developed, I mean, you're being forced right now. I don't think the, the spirit could have made it any easier. You're being forced right now to stand up for yourself first and to stand up for truth and to, and to take back your sovereignty. So and yes, to become a sovereign being. And a huge part of that is your is your libido that's that's what protects that's the driving force you know if i was going to put a suit, suit of armor on and i was going to go out into a battlefield i'd fail without my libido i would fail without it because she needs to be within me she needs to be the driving force it's where the passions are inflamed through the libido through through these you know, and, and quite frankly, the, these all these little goddesses—they're they're warriors or they're 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 priestesses, and they're always part of the the heroes' mythologies, and and they are warriors in their own rights. And you know, this happened. The Cathars—it's not, it's not widely reported, but I've seen this in the fallout of what's happened because I know a lot of souls who were there. I was there, and you know what happened? They eventually succumb to what they were being accused of doing because once 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 the once the hordes were released upon these loving people these loving communities these communities that the new god that knew heaven well you know um and, and you know, they were fair they were just they were loving. They were. They were. They, you know, every. They were. They were poetic. They. They. They understood love beyond any other 
group of people that ever lived in this earth. They understood the nuances of it. And they were resurrecting the practices of the Essenes and, 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 and the practice between Magdalene and Jesus. And Magdalene was one of the most important, the most important person, or, or, or let's say, um, teacher within that community. But it, towards the end, can you imagine when, they, when the Catholic Church unleashed the, the hordes against these people? They had no idea what was coming. They wiped them out. They, they raised the cities to the ground. They, they, they raped and pillaged and murdered and, and, they, and they killed them in mass. So you can't stand up against it because they, what they used worse than anything else was mind control. Ah. This was the beginning of the inquisitions. This is the beginning of distorted logic that was unleashed to just people. And they were gaslighted to death and they were tortured to death. So you know what happened? What happened was, is that the, 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 the goddesses or the goddesses, they were priestesses. Because in that, in that community, both men and women were priests. And now there were many who, who chose to exit this world through... <clears throat> The, the, the genocide through, through literally jumping in the fire because they were burning people alive. That's when they did it. But there were many who ran and there were many who put up a struggle and there were many who fought and they fought for 80 years. Generations it took them to wipe them out and they still went underground and they still survived. But what happened was that many of the women took it upon themselves to fight with magic. And to this day, they're scarred from that experience. I made them all the time. And they're still trying to fight with magic. They're still trying to change the world through that approach. And you can't do that anymore. You have to let the spiritual realm decide. Fortunately, right. we're no longer living within that age. Right. You mentioned the mustard seed. I love that. But what's changed? Well, a lot of things have changed between five or 600 years ago. It was longer than that. It was seven or 800 years ago when it all happened. And, and we, had to, we had to learn these painful lessons through suffering. We had to really understand how evil could really be and how dangerous and, and maybe how our thinking needed to be corrected to a certain degree. I'm not gonna doubt that that, that was an attitude adjustment we needed also because we were right, but we were not Perhaps we were not um, balanced enough to absorb some of the darkness. The Essene community, what the Essene community tried to do, going back to the time of Jesus, was separate itself from the darkness completely. And that doesn't work. Jesus knew that wasn't going to work. And we had to treat, create a different process where you had to integrate the egotistical and the darkness and the Lilith energies into a higher form. This is alchemy. This is what we're being practiced. But back then, a lot of a lot of our my sisters, in order to save us, succumbed to witchcraft, mm -hmm. and they were guilty just as much um, from what they were while well, they were guilty of, of of what they were being accused of, of doing. And they succumbed to that because they understood the nature spirits and the and 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 the and the energies that existed within nature, and they they tried to employ it. They had to their 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 their, their kingdoms and their families and their their lives were at stake. Not all of them did. But many of them did. And to this day, you still see it. These women who are still raging, and I love them all. They're like sisters to me. I'm so attracted to these women. But I see it, and I go, you got, we got to stop it. We got to forgive ourselves, and we have to forgive those who've transgressed against us. Because what's changed, um, Marie, is simply this it's the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. it, and so, yes. the mustard seed parable is interesting. Because Jesus says is that, that our souls are like mustard seeds or, or the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and it's spread upon the earth. And, and, and some of it's eaten by birds and some of it falls in parched soil and it doesn't grow. Just a few of them grow and sprout and take hold and it can't get rid of it once it, it, it establishes its hold. But what's changed is the soil. What's changed is the earth. We are no longer living in a world or a realm. At least that's the promise. At least that's what I see. And a reality where most of the 
seeds are destroyed where they don't find fertile ground anymore. We are where, where they don't find fertile ground. We are now living in a reality where the where the soil has been tilled, where the soil has been prepared, and and it will be far easier for the mustard seeds to find fertile ground and to sprout. And so we don't have to resort to those dark tactics anymore. They're no longer appropriate for these times. We've learned those lessons. We need to start forgiving ourselves and those who transgressed against us. And we need to move on. We just need to freaking move on. And we need to become the full manifestations of what we came here to be. And, and damn the, the media and damn the scenarios and damn the mind control for what they're trying to, trying to do to us because it's all lies. It's, you said it in your, in your, in your video, it's, a, it's not based upon any foundations of truth. So it will not take hold. It will not come to fruition. It's just Because crap. also this energy is different than it was when you described the other ages. The light is, right. is, is empowered to be powerful again. Right, and that has to do with, metaphorically, with the soil, with the environment that we're supposed to yes. thrive or grow within. It's the same thing. So, so yeah, you know, I mean, the, 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 we finally are into these times and we need to try new tactics. New tools, new ways and understanding. Oh, what I even want to say is, you know, where Bill Gates is, and all these people, Monsanto, have tried to mess with the seeds, GMO seeds, right? But the seeds, e even those, like those are false seeds. The, the new seeds, the ones that will make it, are the ones aligned with source and they're a quantum seed they're a, a, a sovereign seed they can't be abused or messed with in any way and those will be the ones that grow and those will be the the parent seeds the spiritual seeds of these new generations that are coming and you know that may be that how it needs to be that there are fewer of them but the ones that there are that take root are mighty and, and that's also part of the mustard seed metaphor too, is that we have to believe we don't have to, it's not quantity, it's quality, right? We need these very potent, highly um, light infused, you know, the original blueprint seeds and they will take care of things. And, and there are those of us that are, whether we've been in the cathors, we've, we've been through the alchemy, we've, we've, been, we've been in the fires, we've been in the things where we've, faced our mortality and terrifying situations. I think those of us that can focus on the seeds right now, these new seeds, this new age, and we know also the depth of the darkness, not a lot of people can hold both those containers, both that energy. But many of us that are in podcasts like this, that are awake at this time, we're not ignoring the darkness, as we said. We know deeply a lot about the darkness and because of our past life experiences with it, now we're these living Christ figures who understand you have to integrate this and what we do for ourselves, we're also doing for the collective. So we become some of these mustard seeds ourselves, right? We become these vessels to this holy purpose that are holding both and still knowing where we're headed. And we are knowing that the old is going to fall away and self-destruct. And that's the other thing that it, it's not preventable and the people who are sleeping they need it to crumble because as long as it still exists their faith and belief in that still exists right and they enslave themselves and they don't know that so you know it's interesting like you said lilith the abuser or the seductress and then also lilith the victim we are playing this out with ourselves where you know the people who are sleeping are still being seduced as victims of the seducers, right? And then also they in turn become the perpetrators and the projectors and the judgers of people they think are doing what they should be doing at this time. You know, we're all revealing ourselves to ourselves. And what I find, I, I think I said this earlier is, if you wanna know how aligned you are with these new frequencies, which is where everybody is going, the floods are going to flood us there. They're going to lead us there. If anybody saw the movie, Evan Almighty, there's this, it's this kind of a modern day story of Noah anyway, um, that takes place kind of in Washington, DC. But towards the end of the movie, the whole, the, the dam breaks, the flood comes and it, and it arrives them exactly to the revelatory point that all the truth comes out that everybody's like, no, no, those things aren't happening. 
And this is this time and all those floods are going to be could be scary and trigger us and the floods are here. The floods are here and people are still not seeing them. I think it's amazing to me that they're so self evident now. They were subtler before, but they're here, but still people are so unaware. So now the floods, and I think it says in this latest transmission, they're going to be on our shores. They're at our door. They're at our door because it's unavoidable. It is unavoidable to face these things and to call up as you are so perfectly describing that libido energy that has that passion, that sovereignty, that power. Um, it, it needs to meet that in these new ways, right? Where we know, oh, who's knocking? Oh, it's the darkness, right? <laughs> What's knocking? Oh, okay, but I know who the darkness is and I know what my light is. And we can meet that in a different way, transmuting it. And that is going to be the journey for everybody, not just a few. Everybody's going to have to face the darkness and also in the same time, in the same moment, claim their light. It's epic. Yeah, I mean, I struggle with that that notion though, um, will everyone face it or will only a few of us face it? So I, I don't know how it's gonna work out. And I, I, and I, I know this, <clears throat> we talked about this before, but I kept saying, I, I don't know where I'm going. I, I can't see it. I can't see going somewhere else. I don't know where it's going. Well, I, I have a strong suspicion now of what it is. And what, it's, what, what I think is going to happen is consciousness will shift. And, and, and it, it, I mean this literally. Yes. So it, I think it has to do with the magnetism of the earth. Oh. Now, there are many people talking about this, and I've heard it from two pretty good sources or sources that really I have a lot of respect for. The timing's different, dra dramatically different from one person to the other person, but the poles are shifting. The poles are dramatically shifting far more rapidly than it can ever envision. They thought it'd be a gradual process. It may flip. Now, what would happen to our consciousness if that happened? And what I suspect would happen, see, we're many are pre-configured for a different state of consciousness. <clears throat> for a different environment to live within. So, um, I, you know, I can't, I mean, it takes an awful lot to, to breach beyond the veil, mm. you know, in this, in this certain plane of existence. But if the polarities flipped, you know, the idea is, is that consciousness is flowing in one direction, <clears throat> ego towards heart, north towards south. Right. If on the other hand, it were to flip from heart to ego or from south to north, it may activate quite a lot of things relatively quickly in those who are prepared to accept it. And, and so what I mean by that is, is that um, new, new things would start to occur. You mentioned this a little bit and you talked about three things I love, synchronicity, cooperation, cooperation and co-creation. Well, I thought of the major themes of, of the last one that you last um, marinades, um, yeah, channel that you that you that you posted. Um, but you know, it, yes, your life will become more synchronous. Your life will become more intuitive because these are latent capacities that we all have. But now will now be the the, the alignment will be will be will be congruent with these suppressed energies that that have always existed or suppressed capacity that always existed within us. But will that happen to everybody? I don't know, because I think one of the, I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of people are, who are getting the injection are becoming magnetized. Mm, yes. Right? So, so if you created your own polarity through the injection, <laughs> you wouldn't be affected by the polar shifts. And you, and you, you might be locked into a certain, let's say, perspective of consciousness that may only be disseminated through technologies in that old alignment. So, so it is a possibility, I don't know. Um, and then I, I, I'm just looking at all of these people that are refusing to face their truth that's right in front of them, the reality. And are they opting out by following whatever the heck Araman or Satan or Lucifer and the globalists are wanting to do and just opting out by getting the injections and exiting? the world through the consequences of those injections. I don't know, but you know what? 
every moment that we don't rectify this, more and more people are taking that path. Now, what is the path going to be? I don't know. We, it could be, it could be, and you mentioned this, I think, in your lecture also. You, and I, at least I was getting this sense. You talked kind of like, like how a lot of people that are stuck in the lower perspective or, or who are being mind controlled into a timeline are like zombies. Mm. Said that. Right. So they're like the zombie apocalypse people. And what happens in the zombie apocalypse? You're either going to turn into a zombie, you're going to die first, you know, a spiritual death at least, and then you become a zombie. And then you're like one of these people that know better, but can't find their way out and are trying to fight their way out through the zombie apocalypse. And, and, and in the end, it's just a, it's just a cluster and everyone just dies and, you know, you watch the black mirror and some of those episodes, that's how it always ends. So, um, so that's, that's, that's where ego's thinking leads us into that parameter. But there's another pathway. There's another timeline. Exactly. And in the other time, in the other timeline, um, there are, there are things that manifest that ego cannot comprehend right now. Correct. And, and there are, and, and so when the shift, if it does occur, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed, hoping that it does, is that is that we will be able to see things with greater soul sight, with with greater vision, and so and so things, you know, if it happens, Marie, then we don't have to do these stupid. Um, I mean, this isn't stupid. I love doing this with you, but you know what? I really wish I could meet you in person. I know. This is ridiculous, right? But maybe we won't even have to do that because I could think about, hey, what's Marie doing, and you know, we can connect telepathically. And that we could be able to merge our souls together. This is apparently what's coming. Yes. So, 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 and we could heal through that process perspective also. And so, what we're looking at um, in, a, in an ascended timeline, you mentioned the GMOs and you mentioned the seeds and, and how they're all, and they, won't, they won't be able to survive in the higher timelines. Same with the body. And so, maybe, this, maybe the seeds might survive. But think about it, maybe the seeds will realign, the, the, the new energies will realign the genetics back into the original creations that they came from. Right. Just like- This is those, God's ultimate trump card, is that well, what people think, think so. they're doing to check out, they're actually opting out to opt in. It's possible. I mean, there actually is technologies that's been recorded and there's a man named um, uh, Professor Greg, uh, no, uh, what was his name? I can't think of his name now, but he, um, Tom Bearden, and, and he wrote a lot of stuff in the 70s and the 80s about all this stuff that was coming to fruition, and he was right. He wrote, a, he was a military professor of physics and electro, and, and electronics and, electro, and, 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 and electro engineer. He knew all about these things, and he, and he was really interested in healing technologies, which were already being created in and, and, and to a certain degree test it in the 1970s. And you know what, they do have technology, or they, they did, that could reverse genetic disruptions yes. that were intentionally created through genetic manipulations through science. So it, it is a possibility. Will it manifest that? I don't know. But you know, I'd like to think in the new timeline, it will. Oh, I believe it. In a conversation for another day that I'll seed and faith the size of a mustard seed into this conversation is I, I truly believe in the med beds. I truly believe in the, like the manifestation of what he may have been talking about. I think they're already here. I think that the, the, um, the consciousness is already here. I think the science is already here and I think they already exist. You can actually find videos of these online. The rollout though has to come when the poles shift, the consciousness shifts and people are able to understand and honor the gift being given in this, these technologies and also all the, the old matrixes, divisiveness and the warring and all these energies that have kept us so enslaved. Like people have to go through their they have to go through the awakening process so that we can be responsible citizens of this new earth. And so it's my understanding with all the Nasara stuff, these are other seeds to plant for other podcasts, but to talk about these things, they, they will roll out coming after the floods and the, you know, 
the required awakening process. Now, how people interface with that mandatory awakening, because that's where we are, we're kind of at a mandatory, a required awakening. You know, people can behave poorly and still be required to awaken, right? They can be shocked and dazed and confused by it, but it is a mandatory awakening to remain on this planet and go through this process and still be in a physical body. And, you know, this still remains to be seen. This is things that I see in my channelings. These are things that I have in my own awareness. I listen to people who are talking about these things. I know you're in this awareness. A lot of us that are in podcasts like this are awake to these things. Exactly how I think the exact, of course, precision of it all, that's a God moment. These are God moments that we're going to have to trust the bigger picture of God, not a person, not a human being, but source itself resetting, you know, this, this earth, but the threads and the vibrational roots to all of that have already been well seeded, well fertilized. Like when you linked it to Jesus coming at that time to seed this garden that needed to grow and till the soil for this amount of time. He obviously came at a perfect time when that was because likely knew the consciousness shifts in the next 2000 years that were coming. So there's, so there's a, there's a lot of things, but I have the greatest hope. I think we're going to experience the most epic amazing new world but we're going to have to have the stomach for all the surfacing of this lilith energy all the surfacing of the astrology that's this crucifixion and revelation like that's a lot lilith and you know the solstice this crucifixion energy the grand cross energy the revelations that's why it is a mandatory awakening because everything is going to be here present you know if we did roll call it's all present in one God moment and only source can create a scenario like that where a whole world has to wake up at one time. So it's extraordinary. And, and these podcasts, these kinds of conversations, the connections that you and I share, Paul, and many of us, but you and I, you know, cause is, uh, you know, this, the minute we connected, we had that like, oh, I know you, right? We have this, we're already telepathic in our own way. We've already had these experiences with each other and it's just going to get better and better from here. But, you know, like anything, there's a little bit of labor involved. There's going to be this and we're in it. We're like, it's already happening and there's going to be a moment where the dams really break and people who are still sleeping and they don't have any awareness that any of this is happening, it's going to be at their door, the door of their heart, the door of their house, the door of their community. There's The floodgates are touching everywhere on the planet because it's kind of the floods of, really the floods of God energy, but there's also literal floods going on, water, you know, dams breaking and water rising and too much rain and all of those things. So, you know, I do, I, I'm watching, um, I want to close this out, um, but I just, I'll seed plant this. I might've sent you this link, but there's the story, uh, the TV show series called The Chosen. Are you, have you heard about that, Paul? I have, but I haven't watched it. Oh, you might enjoy it. I really enjoy it because it, it's, um, I've never really watched a movie of like the story in the life of Jesus, but it's actually not about Jesus. Although I like how they depict this Jesus. I would have been friends with that Jesus. I would have walked with that Jesus. That's a Jesus that I know. It's not a religious Jesus. It's a spiritual son of sons, probably how you might describe it. It's not religious. It, not it, religious. It's not religious, but What's even better is it's the story of the disciples who go on the journey with them. It's more his story, but through their lens. And when they're being very human about their experiences, because in their travels, you know, they're always making camp. They're traveling and going to different cities or whatever. And you see what they went through and they argue and their faith falters and they go into fear sometimes or they want to clobber people for not getting the messiahs right next to them. Right. And it's very much more realistic. and. There's something that I wanted to share about that, that he really talks about. This is the great awakening. And it's somebody asks him, but we've been suffering for so long. All these, these things happen to my people for thousands of years. We've been suffering. When, when, when is God going to come take care of business, basically? 
And he says, is there any time, is there ever a time to not be prepared? You know, he has some very great insights in these things and we are living in these times. And he also talks through, they have seven seasons planned but they've only filmed two of them and it's a completely people funded project. So it's really, there's a lot of beautiful things about it. So there's so many things I could say about it. I'm not quite sure exactly what I was gonna say but it, I think it wanted to be spoken in here and it is these, these biblical times and he was preparing them then for the light they were gonna to have to carry through time some more so that more people could awaken and follow, you know, and, and listen for this. And we're in this moment and very likely Paul, you and I have been together in some lifetimes and we have journeyed this together and we're here now. And we're a voice of the faith and the fortitude. We're also a voice of like the reality and being um, aware of the fact that it is hard. It can be challenging. You know, there are triggers. There are moments that even the best of us have doubts. Is this really happening? Is God really helping? Is it really going to lift us up and out of this hamster wheel and this craziness that we've been trapped in for so long as a matrix? So um, I can't, I can only say that I have the greatest, I think the guides just spoke about it, but I feel it, this, um, positive anticipation there's such a, an amazing world that's opening and it's right here it's just like a degree or two beyond our sight it's like we're here and there's a dome over our heads like this but there's a whole world that's about to open that we that has been there the whole time we just couldn't see it because our consciousness got so small and it's how we got so corralled into um the lives we've been living and trapped in for so long so I always appreciate your perspective because you give this deep, rich understanding of a lot of the archetypal energies and the astro astrological energies and the things we've journeyed that get lost in language when languages get shut down and become obsolete. A lot of what you know about Paul, people you know, in this day and age have just been made unaware of or that there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to go do research in that because it's boring or it's irrelevant to our day and modern times. When in fact, all a lot of what you know, Paul, is like so very critical for people finding their faith again and the why, the why of finding our faith and what these times really mean. And there's not meaninglessness in our lives. In fact, everything is meaningful when you start to wake up to all this living energy around us. And you bring this to life in these conversations with me. And I am just... I love talking to you and we definitely need to do this again because there's so many more things we can explore and expand on. So thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I want to thank our listeners for joining us. If you hung in there, I think this is probably going to be a two hour podcast, but it's so rich and full of energy. And if you are having a spiritual crisis or you're struggling with not understanding or you feel like you can't see or you you're willing and wanting to have faith but you don't even know where to begin you know it's like being in the energy of people like Paul and I in a conversation like this it's just heart to heart there's nothing really planned like you know insights or inspiration comes through the two of us we get on the call and we we think about you know we just ask each other do you have something that's in your heart to share and and we go with that. And here we have this amazing co-creation. Life is meant to be like that. It doesn't have to be these very crafted and carefully edited um, presentations. It's, it's actually the exchange of ideas and getting the energy flowing that is actually what gives us the faith and fortitude and the life force and that libido energy. We, we exchange that and we bring that to life in these podcasts. And, and we share that with you and people get to enjoy that perspective and that energy. And there is a living energy here inside us. So I want to thank everybody for spending your time with us and visit us again, because Paul and I will be back. I feel like, like there's a two, part two, part three, part 10 coming. <laughs> so, um, but until, until next time, we send you blessings. Namaste.